Good afternoon. We're um, live from uh, San Diego, and we're talking today with Dr. Cassano. And Dr. Cassano has an expertise in environmental science, um, really dealing with toxic exposures. So I'd like you to start off by telling me about your sort of your educational history, if we could start with that. Um, well, um, I, I went to college up in Westchester and then um, did graduate work in human genetics at Columbia uh, and then decided that, uh, at that point um, I had a choice of where to go to medical school and I decided to do the um, Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, which is a medical school for all of the, not only the armed forces, but also the Coast Guard um, and the Public Health Service. Uh, and so after you completed all your medical training, were you in the service for a period of time I was as well? in the service for 24 years. Okay. Um, I first trained as an undersea uh, medical officer, which included diving and submarine medicine, and then um, did my residency at the University of Michigan in occupational and environmental medicine. Okay, so I'd like to sort of focus on the, obviously, the occupational environmental medicine, because a lot of our service men and women have been exposed to things in, depending on which period of war we're talking about, correct? Mm -hmm. So if I can tra could transition um, to sort of the, one of the current issues that we're facing with some of our clients are those who are exposed to burn pits and some of the disabilities that are related to those burn pits. And right now there's no presumptions for burn pit cases. Exactly. Um, so how would you go into doing an analysis of medical opinion, if you will, um, for someone who's exposed to a burn pit? What, what are the factors you're going to look at? Because I'm, I'm guessing you don't have real-time air samples, for example. Well, there's, there, are, there is some sampling data that the DOD did. They did it, you know, spot testing. Mm -hmm. There's some question about whether the burn pits were actually <laughs> functioning when they were testing or whether they were testing upwind or downwind or whatever. Uh, but you can at least get an idea of what kind of chemicals mm -hmm. Uh, were, 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 were being thrown into the atmosphere there. You can, and then you have to listen to the individual service members about what their experiences were. I've had um, veterans who have said, yeah, my, the air, we had little space air conditioners and you know, we had to change the filter just about every other day because it would get clogged, there was soot everywhere. When I would come back from running, I would have black soot in my nose. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to look at where they worked, the proximity to the burn pit. You have to look at where they lived and the proximity to the burn pit. Um, and then you have to do that same literature review of, okay, it says that there were, for instance, there were dioxins that were um, present in the atmosphere around, around the burn pits. Um, how much do I think this person was exposed to to that air? Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you get into the issue of dose, which is always impossible right. um, to deal with uh, because you don't have any good dosing information. Uh, and so you have to use these sort of indirect measures of how much soot, how much, you know, did you, did, you know, did, was your throat irritated, were your eyes irritated? Um, and then would you also look at genetic predisposition, those kinds of factors, family history? Well, you look at family history, but as, as I've said many times, unless you've got a true genetic disease, mm -hmm. hemophilia, Huntington's chorea, one of those diseases, genetics predisposes somebody to develop a disease, um, possibly, depend, depending on their genetics. So, uh, because they may have one enzyme in one pathway that is more susceptible to, let's say, Agent Orange or whatever. Okay. So, those are the people that either develop disease earlier mm -hmm. or develop more severe disease, or these are the people that actually, um, you know, will develop the disease over a long period of time. So, uh, but it's never, it's never a rule out for the other toxicant. And the reason for that is toxic. So that, that's important when you say it, it never excludes the possibility right. or the probability, right. depending, that the uh, exposure and service caused the condition. Yeah, and, and part of the problem is, you know, it says, did it cause? Right. It doesn't, in other workers' comp fields, 
substantially contributed to right. um, is the language. Here it's a 50-50 proposition. I mean, it's, it's a more generous standard that you have to meet. I mean, a less generous. Less generous. Less generous. Standard. Well, and it's, it's more a, generous to the better. There's no, it basically says that this, there's lots of ways to interpret it. Mm -hmm. um, the way most people interpret it is this caused it alone to the exclusion of other toxicants. Ra you know, and most of the time that's not how toxicants work. Everybody does, the, and I, I think I, I, I've used this, it's not like which sperm gets to the egg first. It's like smoking says, I was here first, I get to do all of the damage, and you other guys go home. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. They're all working their damage, and they're all causing this disease in concert. If you look at things like smoking and asbestos, it's actually worse than that. It's not just additive effects, they're synergistic. They work together uh, to cause lung cancer. The last thing I want to say is talk about late, latency periods, if that's the right way mm -hmm. to characterize this, because these veterans in Vietnam served many, many years ago, and they're still developing these cancers decades, mm -hmm. decades later. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that that will hold true with, we won't know the full picture of like the veterans that were exposed to burn pits for years and years to come? Or is well, the science getting better so you can learn faster? I guess that's really what I think. There's no way, there's no way to hasten the late, I mean, somebody's either gonna develop a disease, they're gonna develop a disease when they develop a disease. And unfortunately, when you look at epidemiology, you need more people with the disease in order to be able to have enough of a group to make an informed opinion. To make an informed opinion. Yeah. What I think, maybe not at VA, but in other arenas, I, what I think people are getting better at, number one, is being a little bit more um, positive toward animal data okay. and utilizing animal data in a more predictive way. I think we're also good, better at looking at analogous chemicals. And so you look at PCBs versus dioxins. PCBs and dioxins are on a sort of a continuum. Okay. Um, PCBs are not a dioxin, they're considered a dioxin-like compound, but they are a halogenated, um, they are a halogenated um, hydro hydrocarbon product that has a phenyl diphenyl group. Um, and so they're very similar in their effect. Okay. Uh, they, um, PCBs do have additional effects mm -hmm. because of some of the other moieties on it than some of the dioxins do, but definitely TCDD, which was the contaminant in 245T, right. is the most potent dioxin out there. Okay, and that, that was part of the Agent Orange? That was part was of the Agent Orange yeah. uh, thing. But all of them, 245T is now banned, 24D is not, right. but probably will be, because they all have similar effects. It's just how potent they are as a toxic. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we finish up today? Um, anything else you want to ask me? I don't, I don't. I don't think so. I really appreciate your time today. We really appreciate your time. So thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. <laughs>